Well, good morning, church. I hope that you're doing wonderful this morning. I see you're ready to worship. Everybody's going ahead and standing to their feet. We've been taking opportunity, making time for prayer. We've been praying and we're called to prayer. That's what the body of Christ needs to be doing is praying in this day and this hour. But we've been taking the opportunity to pray over different nations around the world. And this week, we're going to be praying for the nation of France. Maybe you don't know a whole lot about France. Maybe it's, it's a, this is a great opportunity to dig a little deeper into what this nation is about. What is the, the Christian history of a nation? This is a great opportunity to fall and ask the Lord, would you help me to have love and compassion and a brokenness for a people I don't even know? But the nation of France is made up of 68 million people. That's a lot of people. Pastor Jess shared a, a statistic this morning that one in 25,000 people, there's one church for 25,000 people in the nation of France. How many of you say, is there 68 million people that are in the nation? We need a lot more churches that are there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But not only do, is there a need for churches to be planted and people to live for Jesus with all the faith that the Lord has given them, but they need to have the faith to preach the gospel, to get it into the places where they work, into their communities, get it into the darkest places. This says, maybe somebody has said, I can't take it. That's a Muslim community. That's full of Catholicism. The gospel is still true. The gospel is still powerful. It is needing to be preached. And then lastly, there's a great occult. People are going after the things of the occult that needs to be broken. There's people that are very secular, but there's people that are looking into things like witchcraft and Scientology. They're looking into things that are absolute, the absolute opposite of who God is. So I want to read this scripture together before we link our faith together. This is in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. It says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Then I shut up heaven, and there, when I shut up heaven, there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. I know this is talking to the people of Israel, but if it worked for them, I believe it can work for us, and I believe if it worked for us, it can be work for the people, 68 million people that are in, in, in France. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Father, we thank you that, Father, we can call upon you, Lord. You are holy. You are righteous. You are the one that, that forgives all sins. By your blood, Jesus, we are forgiven. By your blood, we are set free. Father, these 68 million people, Lord, they need your blood to cover them. Lord, they need the gospel of Jesus Christ preached to them. They need it exemplified in every moment of love being shared, Lord. Lord, I thank you that, Father, there are people waiting to hear the truth of your word. They are waiting to experience the depth of your love, Father, through us, Lord. I pray that, Father, the Christians in this area, God, will begin to be full of courage, full of faith, to go out and to love the least of these. Go out and to love those that, Lord, that could, people would say, could never be one to Jesus. Lord, I pray that, Father, that those that are diving into the things of the occult, Lord, I pray, Father, for dreams and for visions, Lord. I pray for revelation, God. Lord, that they would just sense, Lord, this is something that I've got to flee from. This is something that I've got to get away from, Father. But, Father, over the nation of France, Father, we plead your blood, Lord. Well, Lord, we ask for your presence. We ask for revival to come to that land, Lord. Lord, I, I know that that land is known for, for, for great bottles of wine, but Lord, I pray for a great outpouring of your spirit, Lord Jesus, that the greatest vineyard, the greatest vintage, Lord, is yet to come because it is by the outpouring of your spirit, Lord. But Father, we just plead your blood and our Lord ask for your presence. Stir our hearts, Father, stir our hearts to pray for this station this week in Jesus' name, amen.
you for the work of the cross. We thank you, Jesus, for your love, your mercy, your goodness, and your faithfulness. We love you, Jesus.
everything changed It's getting harder to recognize The person I was Before I encountered Christ I don't walk like I used to I don't talk like I used to I've been washed from the inside I've been washed from the inside
Lord, thank him for the blood. We thank you for the blood, Lord. We thank you for the blood, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you for the blood. Let's just look at your neighbor and say, it's only by the blood. Could have only been the blood. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, for your obedience, for your faithfulness. We thank you for your son who lived such a righteous life, such a holy life, such a selfish life. For your son who gave his blood for us. We thank you. Could have only been the blood for the addict who's been set free, for the sick who's been healed, for the lost who's been saved, for the prodigal who came home. If it weren't for the blood, the blood of Jesus. One last time, just say, I thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood. Before he ever went to the cross, he introduced his disciples to the Lord's Supper, to communion. I don't think they really had a full knowledge or understanding of what he was saying to them and presenting to them or that they would even know what it would be like after that. But a few things took place. Jesus said, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you and suffer. That was the meal. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took the cup and he gave thanks. He said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He took the bread and he gave thanks, broke it gave it to them. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's what we're going to do this morning. You guys can make it way back to your seat if you like. We're going to do this in remembrance of Jesus. It's hard to grasp and comprehend the fullness of what needs to be remembered in times like this, but one thing we can't forget or neglect is the cross, that blood that was shed. Amen not neglect that nor forget that. Father, we thank you for the bread. We thank you for the juice as it's distributed, Lord. We thank you for the forgiveness that is in this room, the healing that is in this room the relationships that are in this room. Thank you for the power that's in your presence. And Lord, we do this in remembrance of you. We bless the bread and bless the juice in Jesus' name. They're going to serve you guys. I'm just going to ask you to hold on to it for just a moment. We'll take it together. Right after that dinner and right after that meal, the disciples started to argue, started to wrestle with each other. Who's going to be the greatest one? Who's, who's going to be next in line? And, and then Jesus makes a prediction. He predicted that the most bold, the most passionate, the most zealous one of them all was going to deny him, Peter. He predicted that Jesus predicted that Peter is going to deny him. It wasn't a real good day, it wasn't a real good night following up this. And then Jesus gave them instruction. He said, hey, he said, um, don't take any money with you. Don't take any backpacks with you. Don't take an extra staff with you. He said, just hit the road and go out and minister to people. He said, it'll be enough. 
I think he's wanting to see how far they'll strip themselves down, how far they'll really surrender and follow him and obey him. And only then would they be able to see how faithful and how fulfilling, how true he is to his promises. Then Jesus enters into a garden, and at that garden, he starts to pray, and he took his 12 disciples with him, nine of them. He said, you guys stay right here as we go a little bit further. Then he took those guys, and then he still went a little further, still went a little further. And it was there that he prayed a passionate prayer, a prayer of suffering and sorrow. It's there that he said, not my will, but your will be done. Your will be done. And then after that, Jesus is handed over to law enforcement, if you would, somewhat a band of army, an army of uh, uh, soldiers came to get him, and he willfully surrendered himself. Peter got a little vicious, a little anxious there, and pulled his sword out and cut off the ear, and uh, Jesus took it and put it back on and healed the guy. Jesus has to go to Pontius Pilate. Pilate asked him, he said, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, it is as you say. He has to go before Herod. He took the place of Barabbas. He got on the cross and After he'd been beaten and scourged, skin ripped apart, unrecognizable. And they hung him up on that cross, nailed his hands, nailed his feet, put a crown of thorns on him, speared him in the side. They were trying to get every aspect of life out of him but they didn't realize where his life really came from. And if the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body. Remember last week that the waiters must be have oil in their vessel, right? Have the spirit of God in their vessel. You can be speared, you can be nailed, you can be thorned, you can be beaten, you can be bruised. Blood and water might come out. But if you have the Spirit of God, they cannot kill you. Death can have no part of you. You'll have that resurrection power here on earth, and you'll have that resurrection from this earth to spend eternity with Him. That's what He provided for us. When Jesus went away, He said, look, I've got to go through all this stuff. And it's almost like He's saying, I'm good with it. If this is what it takes, for what it takes for what? That you and I, that you and I could be given from him the spirit from heaven. Amen? So just a few things to remember when we take communion today of what Christ has done for us, what he provides for us, and what we can have from him now. The cross afforded you and I what money can't buy. Money can't buy a healing. Money can't buy deliverance. Money can't buy love. Can't buy any of that stuff. Anything you can think of can't buy it. But his blood can. Amen. But his blood can. I think you've been served. Why don't you hold your bread up where you are? Lord, I thank you for the body. I thank you for the life that you lived. Obedience, sacrifice, devotion, desire compassion, love, truth. I thank you for the suffering that you went through. Thank you for the truth that you preached and taught and the prophetic insight that you gave. There was so much encased in that one body and you gave it all for us. He said, this is my body. Take heed.
Lord, I ask that you'd forgive us for any way we've ever disrespected you with our tongues, our hands, our eyes, our ears, our bellies, our feet going down paths that were not made for us. Forgive us for all the times we've re-crucified you or crushed you, caused you grief or suffer. Lord, I, I plead with you, I beg with you, forgive us of any wrong we've committed. Take a moment. Lord, forgive us. Any thought that did not come in agreement with the thoughts that you have, forgive us. He also took the cup and he held it up. He said, this is my blood, which was shed for you, for the remission of your sins, that you could be forgiven, healed, restored, renewed, refreshed, that the life of Christ could conquer the wages of sin death he said take and drink this is my blood shed for you for the remission of your sins let there be life Lord help us to get so mindful of all that you've done for us all that you are that we wouldn't go a week without remembering you or thinking of you you're great, you're glorious, you're kind you're faithful and you're true And we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor, for you deserve it all, you're worthy of it all, in Jesus' name. As they're serving you, you can pass your cups into the center there. I want to go ahead and declare the the sower's blessing over you this morning. We're getting ready to bring our tithes and our offerings into the house of the Lord. I declare the blessings of the covenant that are yours in the Lord Jesus Christ as you're obedient in the giving of your tithes and offerings. God's word says, prove me now in this. If I will open up windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. I proclaim financial increase on you and your household. I call for better jobs to those who need or desire them. I declare favor and breakthrough in court cases, settlements, inheritances, and estates that are justly yours. I call for the increase blessing on sales commissions, raises, and bonuses, and promotions that unusual financial opportunities would come your way. I call forth unexpected monies to be discovered. I bless all entrepreneurs. May your minds be inspired with godly ideas for creative inventions. I pray for those who own your own businesses that abundant blessings be released on your company as you bless your employees also. I pray for every single parent and every single person, that you'd have a personal revelation that God is your source. He is your Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. He shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I can testify. I break the curse of debt off of you and your household. I pray for uncommon grace to release you from the stress and the burden of being in debt. I break the mentality of deficient spending off of you. I pray the peace of God which transcends human understanding to guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus and that you're released into reality of financial freedom. I ask the God of the covenant to rebuke the devourer. That's what the word says. To rebuke the devourer for your sake and to restore all that has been lost or stolen. God's word says, the blessings of the Lord, it makes rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. It says, a gift opens the way for the giver and ushers him into the presence of the great. And finally, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 defines true prosperity. God gives seed to the sower so that he is able to make all grace abound to you. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And the people said?
Amen. Amen. You can serve the people. Father, we thank you for the giver. We thank you for the gift. Thank you for your promises and your ways. They're higher than ours, better than ours. And I pray for each person in here to experience a blessed life, a favorable life. Lord, those who need jobs, let them find jobs. Those who are set for promotion, bring promotion into their life. And Lord, we receive the gifts today to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning. Uh, It's so good to have you here with us at the well this morning. We just want to say, especially those of you who are our guests this morning, we're so glad to have you. There are some cards in front of you in the seat backs. If you take the opportunity to grab one of those, fill it out. You're matching me. You're matching me. I got dressed first. Uh, He came in. I said, oh, look, we have on the same color. Anyway, uh, it's so good to have you with us this morning, and uh, it's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord and worship together. We do have a lot of things going on. The fall is always an exciting time around here at the well. We have a lot of things that we get involved in opportunities and ways to give. And first of all, we want to do, we want to say thank you for all of those who brought coats, blankets, supplies. Um, we have a team there now, another team leaving out. We're going to pray here in just a little bit over them, uh, going down to help with disaster relief. So it's just such an amazing thing. Thank you for being a part of that. Uh, We are so appreciative of that. So ladies, tomorrow night, we have our Flourish Women's Meeting, and we're so excited about that. It starts at 6 o'clock. We're having soups and breads and crackers, and he's not a soup person. But you ladies sign up in the app if you want to bring soup or breads, crackers, cheese, whatever. We're going to have a great time together and a time in the Word. So you don't want to miss that. And so the men are not left out. We do have a strong men's camp out coming up. So you guys don't want to miss that. You can uh, talk with Mike Hicks or see it in the app as well. But it's going to be on Friday, October 18th, starting at 5 o'clock until the next day around noon on Saturday. Grab your camping gear. I don't want to miss anything. Grab your camping gear, cornhole boards, s'more supplies, snacks and beverages, and meet us there. So they're going to provide hamburgers and hot dogs, but you bring snacks and sides to go along with that. Sounds like it's going to be a good time. So you don't want to miss that. Man. Good time of fellowship. Also, our Trail of Treats, which we talked about last week, October 31st, opportunity to be a light to our community. You know, we've been doing this for years, and God has touched many lives. So get involved, bring candy, sign up to be involved. You can see um, outside for that. Also, School of the Prophetic. November 1st and 2nd is our first annual School of the Prophetic, so you don't want to miss that on November 1st and 2nd. Sign up for that. It's going to be a great time of teaching, and I cannot not mention, sorry, Supper at the Well next week just because it's a little different. I usually would not take two weeks to announce, but it's going to be our chili cook-off, our annual chili cook-off, so somebody raised their hands up back there. I saw you, John Ware, praising the Lord back there, Um, so somebody needs to sign up for that early. Make sure and get all your recipes uh, tweaked really well. We will have prizes. Good time of fellowship on Wednesday night before church at 515 on the 20. Third, thank you. 23rd. Third, 23rd, thank you. Thank you. you got it? <clears throat> well, I guess she just made the school the prophetic annual. Yes. <laughs> so we're working on the second year now, so I uh, do want to encourage you to come out. I believe everybody, honestly, listen to me. I believe that everybody should learn to live a prophetic life. I'm not talking about merely giving prophecies. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you should know when it's time to go to the store and when it's not, when it's time to go to a mall or not, when it's time to take a left-hand turn or not, you should be led by the Spirit. Uh, Do you you hear me? You should be, listen, how many of y'all have ever been in the wrong place at the wrong time? And how many have ever found yourself in a really good place? You're like, how did I get here? But you knew that you're walking with the Lord, right? He got you into that place. It could spare, save lives, accidents, theft. I mean, all these different things. If we learn to walk in the spirit, it's not just designed for some spiritual moment over there. We are spiritual beings living in an earthly body. Amen. Jesus was, Jesus only did. He only did. He only did what was right. He only did what was right. 
Uh, and he only did what he saw or heard his father saying or doing. That That's where he lived. And he came to teach us that type of a submissive lifestyle, an agreeable lifestyle uh, with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. Scripture says, for as many as are led by the Spirit. And you know, we talk about being born in the Spirit. We talk about being filled in the Spirit. But as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. That's what it says in Romans 8, 14. Uh, we want to have that, want to have that oil in our vessels. Amen. Want to have that oil in our vessels. Anybody with me this morning? So I want to encourage you. That's what going to be about living a prophetic lifestyle, learning a prophetic lifestyle. Well, listen, I want to uh, cover just a couple of other things we get going here too. I think we have some pictures from Pastor DJ uh, in uh, North Carolina. And so maybe you can throw those up. There's Zach. He took a couple guys with him. They left out Friday with our coats and blankets. Thank you all so much for the coats and blankets. They stopped on the side of the highway and helped somebody repair a tire and to fix that. I think he said it took three jacks of hammer and, and four people or something like that, but they got it fixed up there. And so that's them out working in the, in the community. There's Hampton. Uh, is that Hampton? Yes, it is. Uh, working out at one of the distribution centers and we're getting stuff. So all that stuff that you brought in and gave uh, is out and it's going out and getting into people's uh, lives there. And so there goes some of the blankets and stuff heading down the hall. So I don't know how many pictures came, so keep them rolling, boys. Okay. That's Zach wearing a vest. So it's a, X marks the spot, so... All right, guys, you're getting into my preaching time. Come on. All right, there we go. Good. And, and then also, we had our very first uh, Love Thy Neighbor outreach into Goose Pond Apartments uh, down here. And this is something we're going to do on a monthly basis here. So once you kind of show that, I think we have a pic few pictures of that also. Uh, they're going down in the community there and connecting with the people in the community and having, uh, it looks like face painting and meals, whatever, and just spending time together. I think that's a little croquet going on there. Come on, somebody. And so got to meet a lot of people, love on people. Denny Atkins oversees that Love Thy Neighbor, which is a monthly outreach into apartment complexes, welcoming new people into our community. But this one is getting grounded in there and living, uh, working in that living atmosphere there and doing outreach in that community. So uh, isn't that awesome? So uh, listen, if you want one of those t-shirts, there's only one way to get one. Go be part of the outreach. Amen. Uh, so I want to encourage you to be praying for that. There they are. Look at that. They spelt love with their hands there. See that? The L-O-V-E. Yep. Took me three times looking at that thinking, what is he doing? What is she doing? Why? Anyway, there you go. Thank you, Denny, for that outreach. Get in touch with her if you'd love to be a part of that and uh, to get out and to love our neighbors in our community. Amen. Anybody ready for the word of the Lord this morning? Yeah, I am too. It's uh, awesome to have you here this morning. Awesome to know, know that they're going out and about. But before we get into the word, you can, everybody's ready. They're like, Pastor Greg's going to forget to pray for us. Come on, guys. There's a team going out to, to uh, North Carolina after church today. Uh, Pastor Matt's leading them up to hook up with Pastor DJ. Where's the rest of you going to North Carolina? Where they, okay, there you go. I'll ask you a third time. Come on. If you're going to North Carolina, come on down. Come on. Welcome these guys. I know, I know, I already hear it. It's all men, it's all men. There's a reason. Men and women can't sleep in the same room. Okay, so that's a, they had lodging. It's hard to find lodging down there, have a place for these guys to lodge and get down there and work. And so uh, that's a good reason why we have these guys coming up here. So they're getting ready to head out. So I want to pray over them. Why don't you reach your hands this way? Father, I pray grace, grace over each one of them, Lord. I pray safety and peace, Lord. I pray divine influence upon their life. Use them, Lord. Put them in the right places at the right time to do the right things, Lord God, that would bring glory and honor to you. Father, I pray uh, that you would guide their thoughts, guide their hands, Lord. Let them be useful to each and every person uh, that they come in contact with, Lord. Thank you that we can send help from Scottsboro, Alabama to the region of North Carolina. It's been so devastated. We bless them today in Jesus' name, favor in all things that they do. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You can turn with me, if you have a Bible with you, you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to talk a little bit out of Ephesians chapter 5, they're going to be going into Psalm 100, the 100th Psalm, I don't know if you're familiar with that Psalm or not, it's a great Psalm, you've probably sung from it before, you've probably quoted it at different times, but we're going to get there in just a second, but if you have your Bible, you have your fingers in there where it's at, when you're ready, you can hold your Bible up and say this with me this morning, say this with me, this is my Bible, 
I am going to be who it says I can be. It was written for me and for you, for our correction, our direction, and soon coming resurrection. Oh Lord, be it unto me according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I haven't said this in a while, but that's so important to come in agreement with the word of God. It kind of prepares your heart to be the soil for the word to come in. Listen, every seed has the potential of a 30, 60, or 100-fold return. That's what it says in the scripture. But the only way they can get that, that seed has a potential, is the heart. It's a 30% heart, a 60% heart, or a 100% heart that is in agreement with the word. You have to receive the word of God, amen? And word for Mary, she said, oh Lord, be it unto what you just said, she said, she said, oh, be it unto me according to your word, the word that Gabriel brought to her. And sure enough, she received the seed of the word of God himself, and she carried in birth Jesus Christ, amen? And so we want to receive the word of God. Ephesians chapter five, pick it up in verse 15. See then that you walk circumcised not as a fool, but as wise. Now, isn't that interesting? I told Gretchen earlier in the week for a little bit of accountability. I said, this is interesting. I feel like the Lord is leading me to Psalm 100 and to preach from Psalm 100. I don't know that I've ever preached from it. I've sang from it before. We sang all about it this morning. Uh, everything that's in there, we're singing about it this morning. And, and I've read it. I can quote it. I know that Psalm. It's just a wonderful Psalm there. I don't think I've ever preached from it. I, I don't preach a whole lot from the Psalms, maybe some teaching there. And I told her that. And as I started looking into it, I thought, oh, you know what? Over in the New Testament, there's a passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter five says that we ought to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so I was like, well, I will open up with that. I just kind of grabbed that. I felt like I was in a conversation with the Holy Spirit. I said, I'll open up with that. And then I get over there and unbeknownst to me, without thinking it through or a recollection there, I realize, oh my goodness, this ties into last week. It ties directly into last week. Now, last week was a precious message. It was a good message. It was a heavy message. It was a, a sobering message there about whether uh, you're a foolish or you're a wise virgin, whether you're waiting for Jesus Christ in the spirit or you're empty and you don't have anything and you're just waiting for him to take you out of here. And he says, you want to be the wise and not be the fool. And listen, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So this isn't just in our waiting, this is in our walking. Most likely, if you need to be somewhere and be prepared at that door, you're going to have to somehow get to that door. And when you get to that door, you need to pick up along the way what makes you prepared for when he returns. Uh, you got to get this. We got to drive this stuff home. I'm only a messenger. I'm only on assignment. I don't know how long I'm here, how long I'm on this earth. I have no idea. Those days are numbered, but I don't know those days. But I know this. I have a responsibility, and I want to have clean hands. I want to have a pure heart. I want to have a good conscience. I want to be able to sleep at night, and I want to teach you the truth. I want to teach you something that will have you prepared for when Jesus Christ comes back. I'm finding consistently and more frequently, I'm finding people who are Christians and say that they're Christians and not finishing the course. They're just giving up. Uh, they, they stop going to church. They stop reading the Bible. They stop praying. And they'll always go back to a one day I said this, friends, I've got news for you. It is not merely a destination. It is a process. And it's a path we need to walk in. Even Jesus said that. He said, if you want to go where I'm going, you've got to follow me. You have to follow me, not choose me and watch me from afar and say, go, Jesus, go. He's not a NASCAR race, friends. He's not a football game, friends. He is a savior. He's a redeemer. He is the one who is returning. He's the only way. Listen to me. He's the only way you can get to heaven is through Jesus, not about Jesus, but through Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And we have to go through Jesus. See then that you walk circumspectly. Let's just look at that word for a moment. This is very important. Very important. Because whether you know it or not, yes, you have a savior. Yes, you have Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But your enemy, the devil, is roaming around looking for who he can devour. 
who he can take down. He has something planned today. He has something planned tomorrow. He has sin is crouching at the door. He has every intention to take you down. He has every intention to cause you to stumble and to fall and to turn away and to drift away from the Lord. He has every intention to keep you in religion, which keeps you from relationship. He has every intention. He hates Jesus. It's not you that he hates. It's the Jesus that you want to serve, who he hates. Therefore, he puts hate on you. He wants to kill you. He wants to steal from you. And he wants to destroy you. Some of you are looking back at your life and saying, I, I think you're right. Because that was like a near-death experience. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So you get up and you keep on going. I, I, right there, he stole something from me. And God is a God who can restore all things. And right there, he, he, he damaged me. And God is a God who can take the old and make them new. And listen to me. God is for you and not against you. You've been walking this path. You've been trying to walk this path. And the enemy's doing everything he can to knock it out. He'll start knocking in your thoughts. He'll start knocking in your love. He'll start knocking in your relationships. He'll He'll start getting into your business, into the things in which you work and you dwell in the midst of. He wants nothing less than to destroy you, to damage you, and to kill you, and to steal from you. That's what he wants to do. So this is important. Why? Well, think about the word circumspectly. Circumference. A circle. Spectacles. Spect. You need to walk aware of everything that's around you. You need to walk and be aware of what's going on in your life. You need to be aware and so you can see what's happening around you so you can stay wise and not become foolish. Are you with me? It's very important for you to have your eyes open, to have your ears open. Here again, it's very important for you to have a spiritual encounter and a spiritual alignment and for you to live a prophetic life so you know how to walk this thing out and how to live this thing out. He says, not as fool as wise. Walk circumspectly. You know, the scripture says in the Psalms that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now listen, if you, if you are struggling with or not certain that the days are evil, turn on the news for 15 minutes and you'll know the days are evil. It's wicked. It's harsh. Difficult. You could also look into Matthew chapter 24 and find out what kind of days we're living in and about the time frame where we are. Jesus said, he said, there's going to be, there's going to be earthquakes in various places, places you have never seen them before. Now you're saying, oh, an earthquake. I'm not talking about, and that breakdown, that word eighth earthquake, tornadoes torrential winds, uh, 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 hurricanes, uh, earthquakes, all those uh, famines and, and pestilence, all those kind of things are going to start happening. Do you realize did you know that America in 2023, 2023 had more disastrous weather than any nation in the world? Had 25, China had 17, and then the list starts going down, down, down. 25. Did you know that last year there were more disasters in America in that year than any year prior to? That something's escalating, something's accelerating. And as a pastor, I think it's important for me to help keep you on the path, but to help lead you in the way that you'll be prepared. I believe there's a very good possibility. I believe there's an absolute possibility, a very good possibility that Jesus Christ could come back in our lifetime and an absolute possibility. He's coming back. He's coming back. So time is valuable. That's why you need to redeem it. And use your time wisely. I, I've been going through this little check here, and I'm like, man, I, I spend time here, spend time there. Where, where's the best use of my time? Where's the best use of your time? Redeem that time. And the days are evil. One thing we need to know also, the days are not just evil, but we're living in a day that they call good evil and evil good. Friends, it's evil. When, when people would want to mutilate their bodies, and I don't know if I've said this on a Sunday morning before or not, but if, if the anatomy doesn't change whether you're man or woman, then why change it? It's deception. It's mutilation. It's, it's destroying. It's damaging. It's thievery. It's abusive. It's wrong. 
Flat out wrong. Flat out wrong. The days are evil. The days are numbered. That's why it's important for you to redeem the time. In Job chapter 14, verse 5, since his days are determined, numbered, the number of his months is with you. You have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. God has your days numbered. God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. In Psalm 37, verse 18, the Lord knows the days of the upright, the number of his days, and their inheritance shall be forever. Here's a good thing. This too shall pass. You and I are going to have to live here the rest of our life. And I know some of us want to check out, but don't check out before it's time to check out. I would call that the, the Greg DeVries going to Walmart. I don't like being in Walmart. Walmart is not my go-to place. It's not my social environment. It's, it's nothing like that. So I go in and I grab something. I'm, I'm checking out. I'm walking. I'm like, oh, I forgot. Ugh. You say, well, make a list. I forgot to look at my phone. Let me finish the sentence. I do make a list, but sometimes I want out of there. Sometimes people want out of here that they're checking out before he lets them out. And then we come up short. We're not fulfilling what he created us to be here for. We'll go to verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, here's a reemphasis. Therefore, do not be unwise. Therefore, do not be unwise, lacking wisdom, lacking good sense, being foolish. In other words, Jesus shares this parable. The disciples are with them. They're passing on this teaching, obviously, all the way down to where the apostle Paul has now come in to this faith with them and connected with them, and he's living beyond them, and he's still teaching the same thing Jesus said in Matthew 25. He's saying, hey, guys, don't be unwise. So it's not just getting to the door and then you think you'll be there. That's like jailhouse or, or bedside uh, salvation, Deathbed salvation. You need to be prepared. Again, he said, don't live that way, and you know you'll be prepared. You'll know that you'll be where you need to be. He said, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So often we spend our time wrestling with the will of the Lord. Should I go to the blue car or the red car? Should I go to this school or that school? Should I take this job or that job? And we feel we're led all the way through there in those choices. And we get there and we go, man, I'm just not content. You see, the will of the Lord is much deeper than just the steps in front of you. In everything, give thanks. Yeah, I think that when you and I learn to be thankful with the car we have, God will be able to trust us with the one we can have. I think when we're, when we're faithful and we do and we serve the Lord and we do all of our work to be pleasing to the Lord in the job that we are, we won't have to worry about looking for another job. Another job will come to us because the will of the Lord is deep inside of us. It's the set of our mind, our will, and our emotions and that we commit that as we sang earlier and we surrender everything to the Lord and we commit to him. That doesn't mean it's going to make it easier. It means it's going to make it better. Are you with me? So having that place of surrender coming, what is the will of the Lord? It's deeper. In Psalm 40, verse 8, it said, I delight to do your will, oh my God. I delight to do your will, oh my God. Uh, listen to me. I, I've said this for years. There's one place better than being in the center of God's will. It's being in the center of God's will where you're gifted. You see, sometimes you're going to be in the center of God's will and your gifting matters not at all. You're not going to be using your gifting. You're not going to be preaching and prophesying. You're not going to be building and developing. You're not going to be doing all those things that you know that your talent, your gift is. But you're going to have to walk out in the fellowship of his suffering. You're going to have to walk out in obedience when there's a cause and a sacrifice that comes with it. David said, in that place, I delight to do that. I delight to do that. Verse 18 in verse 18, it says, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. It's interesting to me. 
that we can write books and have arguments and, and, and uh, discussions forever wrestling over should we drink wine or should we not? Can we drink wine? Can we not? And, and, you know, and then you'll come down to think, well, Jesus turned water into wine. Well, then let him turn your wine into water. It's about the miracle. It's not about the liberty and the freedom. I sat with a minister. He, he may be listening online today. A man who had been in ministry and preached at many different churches and was with people that you and I would know who their names were. But he's in a rehabilitation because he ran around with a bunch of guys and said, hey, it's okay to drink. But it's not okay to be drunk. And being drunk's one thing, but being addicted's another thing. You see, this will build and go and go and go. And you know, I look at it this way. If this is sin, draw my circle out here. Well, why, why get so close to sin that I can dabble with it just a little bit and see how strong I am to resist it? You don't want to be drunk. But you know what the conversation really should be? We should really be having conversation about being filled with the Spirit. We ought to walk out and say, what did pastor mean about being filled with the Spirit and the oil of the Spirit? We ought to be reading the Bible. And if the Word of God tells me that I shouldn't be drunk, then I'm going to stay away from anything that can make me drunk, but I'm going to get as close to anything that can make me full of the Spirit. I think it's a great compliment as a believer. I think it's a great compliment. Somebody says, you're full of it. You're just full of it. I said, I'm full of spirit. It. I'm full of it. It's a compliment to be full of it. You and I ought to be full of the spirit. Amen. Listen, if that's what got Jesus out of hell, it's probably what's going to get me out of this earth. Amen. Come on, somebody. Verse 19. Verse 19, Paul is telling these people at Ephesus, he says, speaking to one another in Psalms hymns and spiritual songs. And I could stop right there and we could start to sweat. And, and I could say, listen, we need to start talking to each other in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Well, the reality is we just did it. What we use on the screen here predominantly, and, and we got into a, a hymn, into a chorus there, we, we use spiritual songs. And, and it was amazing to me. I didn't even bump Gretchen on this one. I was like, they have no idea what I'm preaching. They have no idea what passage I'm going to. And they don't know this, but we're doing it. This is what we're doing. I want you to know why we do it. I want you to know why it's important that you do it. I want you to know this is the behavior. I think, I don't know about you, but I think that this is an evidence that you're in the right place when it's evident on you that you're doing what the Bible says. Now, if you're not doing what the Bible says and you're doing what the Bible has already told you not to do, you're probably not in the right place with God. Oh, it's getting so quiet in here. You hear rat, rat lick butter. This is good for us. This is important for us. You know, you may not be aware of this, but right outside this door, there's going to be two things today. In my life, in your life, and every one of us. We're going to be tested, and we're going to have trials. But we're going to be tested in trials. I'm going to put one more T to it. And there's going to be temptations. And if the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, if Jesus is a good teacher, he's trying to teach us how to do good, how to be good, and how to stay good. Are you with me? Now, I know all those things out there have your head buzzing and your heart beating, and you just want to do this and do that, and you got to get this taken care of. Chill out. Be still and know that he is God. He is not going to work on your time frame. Matter of fact, it hasn't worked on your time frame. But when you can surrender and have peace in God and rest in God and trust in God and belief in God, things will start to work out. And they'll get better because they'll be godly. They'll have his evidence and his fingerprints on it. But I truly believe that, that when, you, when somebody says something, you've, if you have children, you'll understand this. If you have employees, you'll understand this. Uh, but saying it is one thing, doing it is another. Come on. And you put more value in the doing than you do the saying, especially because they've said it so many times and haven't yet done it. But when they start to do it, you start to recognize something's happening. Something's taking place. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We're just going to deal with speaking to one another in psalms. 
In just a moment, we're going to get into the psalm. We're just going to break down this psalm and, and see how that can happen. I'm going to finish this verse. It's important to see what is happening here. But we have hymns, we have spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I want to encourage you to not reserve your singing and your making of melody and your song to Sunday morning or an occasional Wednesday night. Or when there's a CD playing or if they even use those anymore. Or if there's, there's Spotify playing or something going on. Now don't wait just to sing somebody else's song. Scripture says sing a new song unto the Lord. I'm, I'm encouraging you. I remember when I first started this. It was scary. It was weird. It was strange. But it worked. It made a difference. Now, I know there's some old dogs in here. <laughs> I know there's some old dogs in here. It's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. But I'm telling you, this is the way of the word. It's the way of the Lord and the way of the word. That you ought to have a song in your heart, a melody in your heart. You ought to have a psalm in your heart. You ought to have a hymn in your heart. You ought to have a spiritual song in your heart. Make a melody in your heart to the Lord. In verse 20, he starts dealing with the will. So I'm finding here that the will is having a psalm, hymn, or spiritual song in my heart. That's what conditions my will. That's what conditions my emotions. I mean, I was driving in this morning with a song in my heart, and I found myself crying in one song and laughing in the other. Sounded like a pregnant woman. But the reality is, he's developing a new soul inside of me. He's, he's making something rich. And some things are dying, therefore the crying. Some things are coming alive, therefore the laughing. And you ought to try it. And just worship the Lord. Worship your life through. Worship the Lord, okay? He goes on, he says in verse 20, he says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Well, let's just back up a little bit. Are you having a hard time submitting to one another? Let's just talk about relationships in a marriage or parental and a parent. Let's talk about in a relationship as friends. It's not signifying who other than everyone that we need to submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. I think he's telling you preceding what will condition your heart to be able to be being in submission to one another. If you're submissive to the Lord, it'll be a lot easier to be submissive to one another. Yeah. Jesus said to love the Lord, your God, with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. He said, oh, the second one, it's just like it. It's just like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor. Sometimes your neighbor and, and, and someone who's like yourself might be the most challenging thing. But sometimes you need to realize that your neighbor isn't just a person who lives in your hood. It might be the person who works next to you, person in line next to you. And sometimes you're going to have to love people that you don't like. Which is so good because nobody and nobody is like you. So therefore, love everyone. We have a tendency, we think, just the people who like the same things we like, we love those people. That's a very selfish perspective. That's really not Christianity to its highest potential. We should be able to love those we don't like or, in essence, aren't like us. It's one of the biggest problems today is that, that people don't love who they don't like. And the real big problem is there's more and more people they don't like. And so they move to exclude themselves and to isolate themselves. I just don't like people. Well, then you just don't love like God. And he's saying this, that having that song, you know as well as I do. Well, listen, you go into a department store and you're in there and you're walking through the store and all of a sudden you're like, you're feeling like, I feel good. Especially if you're in your 30s, 40s, or 50s, you're like, man, man. And then all of a sudden you realize they're playing the songs from my days. <laughs> they're playing the songs that I used to jig to, I used to dance to, I used to disco to, whatever it is that you did. They're playing your, you know why they're playing yours? Because you got the money. Because you got the money. They want you feeling good. 
They want you to, and you start to redeem everything in that store that you can. And then you walk out and say, why did I buy? I will never wear this. Why did I buy this? And so every so often you put it on in your closet and look in the mirror and you're like, I look good. Almost as good as I did 20 years ago. But you see, you're in that redeeming mode. You're buying, you're valuing. You're willing to pay that whatever amount because you're feeling good. You see, there's something about music. Music will cause you to amuse, get your mind off of other things, but it'll also put your mind on other things. And when you start to worship the Lord with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, no matter, listen, uh, pray, uh, you know, we're, I, I'll praise you when there's, when there's nobody around. Was, it, was that song that we just sang? Huh? I'll praise you anywhere. I'll praise you anywhere. I bet you, I won't bet you. I'm not going to bet you. I don't bet. Would you really praise him in the middle of TJ Maxx? No, I'm not talking about when you found a sale. I'm talking about when somebody took the last one your size and you still went to the dressing room and tried them the size two, like smaller and say, maybe, just maybe. Will you praise him anywhere? Right there at your table in a restaurant. Start to worship him. You know, Lord, think of his food. Ah. Come on. You and you're worshiping the Lord, it takes your mind off the world. You're not worried about what somebody else thinks. When somebody really breaks into praise and worship, they could care less what the person in front of them, behind them, around them is doing. They could care less. They've entered out of here and into him. It will, it will take your mind off of other things, but it'll put your mind on his goodness. So if you're struggling in the world of submission, it's probably because you're struggling in the world of worship. Worship is submission at the utmost possibility. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns. Years ago when Gretchen and I had just met each other and I uh, graduated from the, the discipleship program, Outreach Ministries, and, and I was living with uh, her sister and brother-in-law. That's where I first lived before I got my own place. I was there for a while, and I was right next door to her parents. It was, was awesome. It was incredible. We would sit up until uh, out on the porch until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and, and uh, you know her dad got tired of it. Wore the flat, wore the light out, switch. Had to put in a new switch. You know, was like, tell that boy to go home, you know? And uh, we, would, we would just spend time fellowshipping, dreaming together, talking. And then one time we got over and we, we got on the floor. We're just laying on the floor like maybe you would in your living room or down on our, uh, our, our, our elbows and, and just laying there. She's across from me. I tried to find a picture last night. We couldn't find it. There's a picture of this. And we had our Bibles out and we said, let's go through all the Psalms and any one of the Psalms uh, that are a song that we know that we sing, let's sing that one. And so we did. And so we took this journey. I honestly believe beyond a shadow of doubt inside of me, that moment was more powerful and influential in our marriage than I ever realized. Yeah. Here I am 34 years later and the Holy Spirit says, do you remember that day? Yeah. He remembers it. We were submitted. We sang, blessed is a man. I'm not going to sing them to you right now. We started going through every psalm. And I'm telling you, it took our minds off everything else. And we decided we're going to build a life for God together. Amen. We still sing to each other. We still sing with one another. I'll sing a line and she'll, she'll sing the next line. And we're able to submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. Psalm 100, that's where we want to get to. Psalm 100 starts off in a, in a very strong inflection. It says, make a joyful noise. Shout to the Lord, all ye lands. My Bible has an exclamation point. I know some of you are already checking out. You're saying, that's not my personality. It's not my nature. And listen, probably the personality you're living in is not your personality. And it is your nature, but it's still the sin nature. Now listen, I'm not pouncing on you whatsoever. If God's word says, and he instructs them to tell the people of God to shout unto the Lord, then I think God wants that and desires that. And if we come up with some way and say, that's not the way I worship, we come up with some way and saying, that's not my personality. And listen, if God wants it, 
It's him and you're created in his image and in his likeness. It's what he desires from you. I want to exhort you. Some years ago, they were teaching right here in the church, and this is some years ago, and Micah was, I don't know how old she was, maybe 12 or 13 years old, and I had gone to uh, London, England. I was in London, and, and while I was in London, uh, Pastor Jay Hayes up and I were over there walking the streets, doing some street ministry, and, and uh, uh, the, uh, what they call, the volcanic ash yeah. hit Europe. I don't know, anybody remember that? When, when, when Europe got shut down, no planes were coming in, no planes were going out, we're stuck. Well, listen, we got a hotel.com price line, a, a, a special on that hotel room, but when that happened, all that was off, and we had to stay five or six days later, and the prices went skyrocketing high. We had never prayed like that and fasted like that in all of our lives. And so we're there, and I, I'm praying, and, and every day going by, there's no flights going out, no flights. And, and back home, in an eight hours difference, they're teaching on the seven Hebrew words of praise. And tehillah is one of them, not tequila, tehillah. Yeah, right. You hear me? And so they're, they're teaching, and Micah, who just led worship with them up here, she goes out and she comes home, and we lived out in Boxes Cove, and way back in the, in the woods there, and she's coming back, and she was missing her daddy. Uh, just like Lauren and the girls are missing Pastor DJ right now. She was missing her daddy. Tehillah means to sing a spontaneous praise to the Lord. Not one that's already written. Not one that's already recorded, not one that, that, that Hillsong or, or Elevation made cool, but literally what's in you. Just a little girl. And she's walking to the door and she goes, God, bring my daddy home. She start, that's her song. She said, God, bring my daddy home. God, bring my daddy home. She starts singing it. Well, I'm back over in London, England, eight hours different. And a fire alarm goes off in the hotel. A fire alarm goes off in the hotel. I've been in enough hotels in my life, I can tell if there's really a fire or not a fire. When you do something so many times, you become an expert at it, okay? And we're in the same room. And Jay said, you going to check that? I said, I don't think. He said, I don't think it is, but you might want to check it anyway. I said, all right. I'm the bed close to the door. I get up, walk out in the hall, there's people laughing, there's nothing going on. I was like, good night. You know, and I go back in. And I lay down, and the Holy Spirit said, that's your wake-up call. Call Delta right now, 219-418-014. I go and I get on the phone. I give them my number. I tell them everything. They said, Mr. DeVries, we've been trying to reach you. Can you make it to Heathrow and within the next 30, to, 30 minutes to an hour? I said, I'm on my way. I said, see you, Jay. Got my stuff with her. Got on the plane. There's about seven other people, about seven other people on that plane, give or take. Get on that plane. We fly off. We get up fine, high enough in the altitude. The pilot said, I don't know why. He said, but they just closed everything down again. This is the only flight that got out in a 10-day period. It's the only flight that was able to take off. Nobody else left, and I got home, and I got home because God brought her daddy home. Yeah. That's, that's the power of praise. You see, praise gets you connected to God. He dwells in that atmosphere. You're going to have a closer, more intimate, more powerful relationship. I'm not saying that kind of stuff's going to happen all the time, but that's the only place that kind of stuff's really going to happen yeah. is in the presence of God. Are you with me? Yeah. He says, make a joyful shout to the Lord. Not, not an obligatory shout, like you're obligated. Praise God. <laughs> no, it's a joyful one. It's about, it comes from within. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fullness of joy. Amen. All you lands. Listen to me. There's a lot of acres in this room. Yeah. You see, land is land, but you are the lands he's talking about. You're an earthen vessel. You are made of the dust of the earth. You're the creation God. This is what we, listen to me, this is what we were created for, to worship God. We're created to praise the Lord. That, that is our number one ministry, is to minister to God. You can go and travel the world preaching. The number one ministry is to minister to God, not just for God. Amen? All ye lands, the earth and its inhabitants, the nations. So what's happening here is really bizarre in, in this, this Psalm 100. We don't know exactly who wrote this one. Okay, it's not recorded who, who wrote this one. But they're, they're setting the people and they almost have a New Testament mindset is that this isn't just for us, this is for everybody. 
Because they're tapping into the concept of God, not just the religious and order of man. And God created all people in his image and for his glory. So they're prophesying. They're setting an atmosphere there. Verse two, it says, serve the Lord with gladness. So it says, make a shout, serve the Lord with gladness, not with, not with a, a, a regret, not with frustration, but serve him with gladness. Listen to me. Someone said it to me not too long ago. I hear it quite often, and I commend you for this. People say, man, your church is hospitable. They are friendly people. We don't need grouchy people at the door. We don't need grouchy people serving communion. We don't need half-hearted people doing this, that, or the other thing. We need people who have a heart to serve the Lord, amen, but be glad at it be glad. You know, I remember years ago when I, I realized, I, I, I would say, man, I, I have to preach. And then all of a sudden I realized, no, wait a minute, I get to preach. It was a shift inside of me that brought forth the realization. You don't have to go to church. You get to go to church. You don't have to praise God. You get to praise God. You don't have to pray. You get to pray. This is an opportunity. This is a privilege to serve the living God, to serve the creator of all life, to serve our redeemer our healer. We get to. Look at your neighbor and say, we get to. And then tell him to smile. He says, come before his presence with singing. I can't believe we're singing another song. Here they, they just sang and that's all they do is sing. Someone told me the other day, I was in a business meeting and they said, hey, you're so-and-so. I said, yeah. Oh, love. And, and started talking to the boss. said, love that church. They have got the best singers. Matter of fact, they could all sing at Opryland. That's why I can't. But it meant that much to her. Because the majority of the people that sing here are happy. They're happy. But watch this. He said, come before his presence with singing. You come walking in like this. You come walking in like this. You come walking in like this. You are stiff-facing God. You're, you're stiff-necked God. You're, I'm, I'm telling you, there's freedom in worshiping God. I'm telling you, there's a way to approach God and a way not to. You say, well, I don't think you can, do you know the way not to? I, I'm not as much concerned. If I know the way to, I won't be in the way not to. Amen? Well, we, we, should, we should be coming before his presence with singing. Not mumbling. Verse three. He, he's just given three commands, but he inserts something here. He says, know that the Lord, he is God. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. And you might sit in here and you might have heard somebody say before in their life that they're a self-made millionaire and you might be, but you're not a self-made man. You might be able to make some things in this earth, but you can't make it through this earth without him. You're created in his image and his likeness, fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are his works. All the days of your life are numbered in a book. This book right here. He has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastor. I mean, these guys were in the songwriting groove when they got a hold of this one. And they're laying into this, and, and they, they had no knowledge that Jesus is going to come and say, hey, I'm a shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. You're my sheep. You need to follow me. You need to know my voice. You need to serve me. You need to worship me. You need to surrender. It had no idea. You know, back when it says, worship the Lord, it actually says, serve the Lord. Serving and worship are interchangeable with one another. We'll get to that in just a second. He says, know that the Lord is good. It's God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Verse four gets back into the commands. He says, enter into the gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and be thankful to him and bless his name. I want you to notice that there's seven commands in this psalm. Seven commands. They're telling us what to do. They're instructing us what to do. They're not suggestions. The word of God is authoritative. Has all authority. His word of God will remain. His word of God is, is, is going to uh, last forever and ever. 
God, is, is, he supports his word. He honors his word. He values his word. The seven commands are shout, worship or serve, come, know, enter, give thanks, praise him. It's not just a catchy little phrase to remind you. No, it's instructing you this is what we need to do. Israel's reminded that their God reigns despite all the appearances contrary to it. You know, you and I right now, if we looked outside of our windows and outside of our doors, it'd be contradictory to think that God reigns. God's in control. Look at me, church. God reigns. God is in control. And there's, there's a way to get to him, and it's through praise and worship. It's through the shout. It's through serving and worshiping him. It's through uh, entering in and giving thanks to his name. He says that they, they're reminded also of their missional responsibility. This isn't just this is what we do. He said, let all the lands, all the earth. It's instructing others. It's a prophetic song of what you and I are living in right now. Listen to me. You and I... As Gentiles, there might be a Jew in here. It might be somebody that's Jew, Jewish in their blood. But the reality is the Gentiles, we, we weren't ex- included in the people of God until Jesus came. Amen? Yeah. But this song is singing to us that we too join into this, all the earth. So the first thing is shout. Israel is called to shout for joy to God, the God of their covenant, the God of the whole earth, and is invited to join in a proclamation of his praise. In other words, I'm saying to you right now, you're on the worship team. You're on it. We need your shout. We need your joyful sound. I don't hear a lot of people joining in. We ought to take a praise break like some of those preachers say and just shout to the Lord for just a moment. He's worthy of every decibel of our voice. The writers are encouraging you, the worshiper, to be vocal. You know, enough of the watermelon, watermelon, right? I mean, speak it, be vocal. We're a worshiping community. And this passage of scripture is calling the whole earth to worship like this and to hold nothing back. We should be literally raising the roof off of this place. So then it says worship, which literally means serve. One translation in King James says serve. The term is a bad which is a combination of worship and service. That's exactly what that word means. Explain, every act of worship is an act of service. And every act of service done for the Lord is an act of worship. Now you gotta get that. Every act of worship is an act of service. You are now a minister. You're a Zadok priest to the Lord. You are now the royal priesthood and you're worshiping God and you're declaring that he is good and his mercy endures to ever and to all generations. And you're the minister. And that's what we do when we are worshiping and that worship time, we shouldn't be checking out what they're wearing, how they're playing, how they're doing this. We should all be focused on heaven as much as possible in glorifying God. Because that's a service. And every act of service that you do, anything you do in the church or outside of the church for the Lord is an act of worship. When these gentlemen go and minister in North Carolina and distribute and cut trees or whatever they're going to be doing, help somebody on the side road, they are worshiping God when they're giving their service. You and I ought to live that way. We ought to act that way. We ought to realize we're serving the Lord. We're worshiping the Lord. There could be no separation of public worship and practice and private character. No separation whatsoever. And we need to have a worldwide view. Listen, we're praying for the nations. There's a reason. And we're praying for the nation. It's not going to be long. We're going to start asking for the nations. And we're going to get the heathen, the Gentiles as our inheritance. We're going to see a worldwide move of salvation souls come. We're going to be a part of what's already taken place in some places because we're going to engage ourselves. The, the next instruction, we'll wrap this up. Joel, you can join me, please. Pastor Joel. The next instruction is this. The command is come, which is relational in nature. When you invite somebody in, he says, come in and worship. The nation word is emphasized. It's a command. You need to come. Uh, listen, you're going to have to make some effort to get to where you're going. 
You had to get to the car. And the car had to get you here. And you had to get out of the car and come in here. You had to come in and choose a seat. And, you had, and I would encourage you. I would encourage you. This is an info. I would encourage you to start moving forward. Getting closer. Because there are going to be more people coming to want to experience the presence of God, to experience the love of God, to be healed by God, uh, to be saved. There's going to be more coming. Make room for them. Amen? Yeah. The, the, the next thing, he says, it, to come, it's an act of presence, of praise, service. It's an offering when you come and present yourself before God. The next instruction or command is to know. It's our responsibility to know. The psalm pivots. It, it, it hinges around this intimate command that we get to know, shout, worship, come, brings you into the knowing. Do you hear me? Shout, worship, and coming, serving the Lord. It gets you to know the Lord. As he brings it to the, the last of the commands, it says, enter his gates. Enter his gates. We so often give God the access a certain time. We invite him to certain times of our life and we want him to come into our realm, to come into our domain, to come into our life. He say, no, I want you to come in here. I want you to come in here. And to his courts, deeper levels of participation. I'm trying to condense this a little bit. I know it's a lot of information. That enter in refers to a, a deeper level of participation in corporate worship with God. You know, sometimes you might hear the preacher or one of the pastors or uh, um, leader of some sort, an influence, somebody in your life, and they, they invite you into something. They call you into that. And you're like, well, I'm going to wait until God does. Um, you've heard the story before. The flood's coming. The guy's praying for God to come and rescue truck comes up and says, no, no, God's going to take care of me. And then comes the canoe and then comes the raft then comes the helicopter and then comes the flood. The person's like, why did you not come get me? He said, I sent this, sent that, sent this, sent that. Listen to me. You're being invited and instructed into deeper worship with God. A more intimate, personal relationship with God. You have some responsibility. I can't keep you. I can't hold you. I can't do it for you. This is a message from heaven. A message from God telling you, come, serve, shout, worship. Get into a more intimate and personal relationship with me. It's the Lord's invitation. Enter into his gates. The next one, he says, give thanks and praise. And this further implies the intimacy of relationship with the Lord that previously, most likely, would have been unimaginable. I don't know if I could do that, ever do that. I don't know if I could ever be that way. I don't know if I could do this or do that. He's inviting you into a deeper place and be thankful in the midst of it. I, and the Lord just loves thankfulness. He enjoys thankfulness. Hey, one scripture says, in everything, give thanks. It didn't say for everything. Maturity can thank him for everything. Intimacy gets you into thanking him in everything. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God. Thankfulness starts to open up access. Provisions. Encounters. Knowledge. Peace. He's calling us. I know we're down here saying, you come here. Not until you come here. The best I know and scripture supports it. His way is better than our way. His way is higher than our way. He, he's, he's exhorting you, calling you. I mean, it, it could look like this. And I'll just give it as a, as a, this is not the goal. This is not the goal. 
Uh, this is just to give you an illustration. Worshiping back there in your comfortable place that you sit every week. And then all of a sudden you come up here and you start getting in the altar. And you start worshiping. At home, you listen to a CD. You turn it off. You start praising him and worshiping him yourself. Or you join in or you start using music. I don't know what it's going to look like for you. He's calling us further. Calling us deeper. Calling us higher. He's inviting us. Here's the last verse. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. He's not going to let you down tomorrow, even if you let him down today. His mercy will be new tomorrow morning. The Lord is good. The Lord is mercy. It's, it's merciful. It's everlasting. And his truth, listen to me, and his truth endures to all generations. And again, he's not going to work on your time scale. But he'll work with the time that you give him. So here's my closing. Three resolute reasons to praise the Lord our God. You've got to come to this resolve yourself. He's good. He's good. Why should I praise? Because he's good. He revealed his goodness to Moses. Moses said, I want to see you. I want you to show me your glory. I want, and, and he came down and revealed all of his goodness to him. He's good. Second thing. Reason to praise God. His love endures forever. His mercy endures to all generations. And listen, there, there are some people in here in, in, in my category 16 above. And I know that each one of you, somewhere along the line, found out that his mercy endures forever. Can I get a witness? That his mercy endures forever? That's enough reason to worship him. You may be saying, well, I haven't experienced it yet. Start worshiping him. You will. You'll experience. Here's the last one. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Okay, so I just took you out of the, yeah, the Lord's good. I just took you out of the forever eternal and brings it right back down to generations. I'll tell you one good reason why I worship him. Any of my children in here? I see a couple of them. Any of my children in here? Stand up. Son-in-laws, daughter-in-laws, and loves. I keep worshiping him because of that. Thank you, guys. Man, where's everybody at? Are they skipping church, man? No, oh, they're serving, okay. All generations. I want, I want to be the link. I want to be something that passes it on to the next generation. I know things may not be good in your life right now. I know things may be challenging. I mean, this world is contradictory to everything that we preach and everything we believe. But you need his mercy. You need his truth. You need his goodness. Worship the Lord our God. Speak in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Make a melody in your heart to the Lord. Can we stand to our feet? Father, we thank you for your word. I declare that it's truth. I declare that it does not fail. I declare that it is powerful and it's life-giving. Lord, we come into this sanctuary with one purpose. And if we get stuck there, that's just fine. To bless your name. Church, can you take three more minutes with me and do whatever we can God so gracious and mercy to give us an opportunity just to bless the Lord in the sanctuary thank you Jesus yes Lord we bless you Lord let's give him praise for just a few moments
Come on. Sing if you love us there. We love you, Jesus. Come on and lift Bless your, your holy name. Come on, church, lift our voices. Come on, with all that you got, let's lift a high praise. desire to be a sanctuary of your praise and a place of your presence. You're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. You have need of being born again, forgiven of your sins, redeemed. This morning as we pray, you can pray this prayer. Pray it by faith between you and the Lord. You can be born again. You can be saved. Perhaps you're here and you have been walking with the Lord. Been walking outside of his will and outside of his ways. And you need to get your life lined back up with him. You need to return to the Lord. You can pray a prayer of repentance also. Confess your sins and turn and follow him. And if you pray that by faith, it is as you say, because it is as he says, that if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart, you will be saved. To believe unto righteousness and to live, not just with a Savior, but as a Lord, your life can be transformed. You can be set free, no longer guilty, past sins and wrongdoings. So let's pray together, church. Lord Jesus, today is my day of salvation. Lord, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins and all of my wrongdoing. I'm asking you, Jesus, to come be the Lord of my life and to change my ways by allowing me to follow you Jesus, I'm sorry for what I've done, but I'm grateful for what you've done. I believe that you lived a sinless life and you took my sin upon you at the cross and there you forgave me. And you died, but you rose again. And there you give me new life. Jesus, I ask you, to be the Savior and the Lord of my life. And I thank you for your mercy that is new every morning. It's in your name I pray. Amen. We give the Lord a praise. If you have need of personal prayer, you want someone to pray with you, there'll be people up here waiting for you to pray with you, to minister to you. I want to declare a blessing over you today. And I want to encourage and exhort you to be a worshiper. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance on you. 
May he give you light. May he give you wisdom. May he give you hope. And may he give you courage. If you have need in your, of healing in your body, may the Lord be your healer. And I declare over you peace that comes with protection, provision, and purpose. We bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. We love you. This God is sanctuary.